Uh, Hegel got it right in the famous master-slave dialectic. He said, in a master-slave relationship, it seems as if the master is the master and the slave is a slave. And the master has more power than the slave and the slave has less power and less freedom than the master. Not really. It's exactly the opposite. Even though externally and materially the master can compel the slave and not vice versa, still interiorly it's the slave who's got the power. What? How does that work? Well, just look. The master needs the slave. That's why he has a slave. He needs a slave to do his work. All right, does the slave need the master? Not at all. So the master is enslaved to his need for the slave. The slave is not enslaved to anything in himself. The slave is, is free inside, and the master is an addict inside. He's a slave addict. But the slave, unless he's a masochist, is not a master addict. Hmm. We don't have slaves anymore. Two reasons. One, the Christian conscience, Wilberforce, Lincoln. Two, the Industrial Revolution. Even if it weren't for a conscience, we wouldn't need them. We have machines. They're much more efficient. Everybody in our society is as rich and powerful as a slave owner in a slave society because we've got cheap, efficient slaves made of metal uh, to do our work for us. Well, that's good. That's, that's a liberation. That's a progress, certainly. But it's not a progress if we're just as addicted to our metal slaves as the slave owners were addicted to their flesh and blood slaves. In that case, uh, we are the slave of our very creatures. That would be stupid, wouldn't it? Let's test whether that's the case. One of the questions I used to ask philosophers and psychologists and theologians and sociologists and even sane ordinary people was why we have no time nowadays. We have all these labor-saving devices, which is what technology is. Every piece of technology is a labor-saving device, a time-saving device. So everybody admits that technology has been a spectacular success and we've made incredible progress, uniform progress in technology. And since technology saves us time, we must have more and more time to do with as we please. So we have more leisure than, uh, than people in the past. And, and it looks like we do. The, the, the work week is shortened. And yet nobody has any time nowadays. I know you don't have places like this in, in, in this area of the country, but if, if you were to stroll across the Boston Common in, in, in downtown Boston uh, and ask the first 10 people that you met, uh, do you have time to sit down for an hour with me and talk about the meaning of life? Uh, they would probably say, meaning of life, is that a new kind of uh, drug or something? Uh, nobody would say yes. But suppose this was 100 years ago and you were strolling across the Boston Common and you asked that question, you'd get a few people that say, oh, sure. How come your grandparents had more time with their children than your parents did? Uh, every responsible parent wants to have quality time and quantity time, too, the two go together with their children. Uh, how come it's so hard to do that? How come everybody's on the run nowadays? Everybody knows they are, but why? Where'd all the time go? All these time-saving devices that we've invented have stolen time from us instead of giving us time. How come? Maybe it's the master-slave dialectic. Maybe we're enslaved to our slaves. Can we throw them away? No, we can't do that. Oh, then we're enslaved to them. You're enslaved to anything that you cannot part with that is less than your own soul. So maybe if you gain the whole world, there's a danger that you might lose your own soul. That's not a good profit. Best business deal ever in history. The most practical businessman in history was Jesus Christ. That sentence, what does it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? I think this envy that characterizes the master, the envy of the interior freedom 
that the non-master has. I think that explains the persecution of Christians. The Romans saw these Christians and, and they were happy. They didn't have anything. They were largely poor and uneducated. They were happy. What, instead of saying, I'm gonna learn from them, they said, interiorly, unconsciously, uh, I hate you, you're better than I am. Because of course, the better you are, the more people will hate you. There's two lifestyles that are very, very dangerous. Great saint, great sinner. The only lifestyle that's safe is wishy-washy Charlie Brown in the middle. Because if you're a great saint, people will martyr you. And if you're a great sinner, people will put you in prison and maybe execute you. Because people are afraid of greatness. Greatness of good or greatness of evil. And Christians and Jews were distinctive. And the Romans hated them and feared them. So it's envy. One of the few sentences uh, that you can make in the English language, there's an infinite number of sentences you can make, but one of the few sentences that no one in the history of the world who has ever uttered this sentence has ever believed it is the sentence that expresses envy. I'm just as good as you are. Nobody ever said that to another human being unless they felt inferior. In other words, that's always a lie. Well, I'm not saying that envy necessarily results in egalitarianism, but that there is a dark and dangerous connection there. And as Lewis says, uh, much of egalitarianism comes from this ignoble origin of envy, the I'm just as good as you are. Well, if egalitarianism is, as Lewis thinks, uh, artificial rather than natural, then it's not always good. Anything natural is good because God made it, God designed it. Things that are artificial are not always good, not essentially good. They can be used for good or for evil. Any artifice is always open to, to two things. So there's going to be a good use of egalitarianism and a bad one. And if you simply apply it to a field like education, uh, it's going to be bad. The effects of simple egalitarianism in education, treating all students as equal, uh, is ridiculous. Giving everybody the class average, for instance. Well, what is true in education must, by analogy, be true in politics, too. Perhaps this goes as far as Walter Lippmann suggested in a book called The Public Philosophy, written about 50 years ago, in which he said, here's, here's a fundamental question for democracy. We elect representatives to carry out our will. So we are sovereign, and they are our servants. Now, do we insist that they agree with us in everything, or do we trust them to make their own decisions? Do we elect them because we think they're wiser than we are, and maybe they can teach us something? Or do we elect them because we think they're no wiser or more foolish than we are and simply reflect our will directly? There's arguments for both sides. But it's the second that's more egalitarian and by Lippmann's standards, the more dangerous. I'm not sure whether he's right on that technical question or not, but that's the kind of question you have to ask when you apply it to politics. Now, unfortunately, uh, I, like Lewis, am an absent-minded professor who is not very expert in politics, much less law, uh, but more in philosophy. So what I'd like to do now is not so much apply this to politics, although I will make one very specific application to politics at the very end of this talk, but I'd rather like to go back into philosophy and look at the foundations of aristocracy and the reason why it's more fundamental and more natural than egalitarianism. I know you'd like to, and maybe I would too, uh, do the opposite thing. Uh, take this principle, which I've just given you a, a kind of a thin version of, and immediately apply it to concrete particular problems. Uh, I can't do that, because I don't know that much about the concrete particular problems. Uh, so I'd like to do the other thing, which I'm more familiar with, namely thinking backwards and validating the principle of aristocracy.